A very good afternoon to everyone. The Energy and Resources Institute welcome you to this thematic track discussion of the world's sustainable development in India with our partner Tata Clean Tech Capital. Today's world is highly dependent on fossil fuels, and we are looking to explore new environmental friendly renewable energy sources to make for us a future which incorporates clean energy along with carbon neutral India by 2070 requires innovating financing models like green bonds, issuance of asset backed alternative financing models and etc. This requires a strategic and systematic infusion of policy tools. This thematic track will deliberate on different innovating financing solutions that India can forge to bring in clean energy transition and the role of different stakeholders to bring alive the vision of a decarbonized India. For this, we have an eminent panel and the panel includes Mr. Sujoy Bose, the Managing Director and CEO, National Investment and Infrastructure, Infrastructure Fund. Mr. Sujoy is a business leader with over three decades of extensive experience in emerging markets, investing and project finance. He has worked on projects covering 50 countries across Asia, Africa, Europe, Middle East, Latin America, and the Caribbean. Ms. Cecilia Tam is a team leader, Clean Energy Finance and Investment Mobilization, OECD. Ms. Tam is an expert in clean energy finance, energy technology deployment, and innovation. Ms. Namita Vikas, Managing Director, Optus ESG. She's the founder and managing director of Optus ESG. She's a senior, senior business leader with 30 years of diverse global experience in climate strategy and sustainability across sectors, including banking, technology, FMCG, with particular focus on sustainable climate and green finance. Mr. Girish Kadam, senior vice president and co-group head, corporate rating, ICRA Limited. Mr. Girish, uh, has been associated with ICRA for over 17 years. He is responsible for rating and research in the corporate and infrastructure sector, specializing in power utilities, renewable energy, renewables and, and, and engineering sector. And Mr. Pushkar Kulkarni, Managing Director, Infrastructure, CPP Investments. Mr. Pushkar holds more than two decades of experience, experience in infrastructure covering technology to operations and investing. He has led several M&A transactions across his assignment as also worked and has also worked on several MarQ infrastructure projects. We welcome everybody. I now request Mr. Pankaj Sidwani to give opening, who's also, uh, who's also uh, who's the Chief Business Officer Tata Clean Tech Capital to give opening remarks. Thank you very much, Watsila. Thank you, Terry, for this uh, splendid platform, which brings together senior leaders from across governments, corporates, investor community, and civil society to discuss and debate ways to a more sustainable and greener world. Good morning, good afternoon, uh, good, good evening, depending on where you are. Absolutely delighted to be here. And before we jump into the discussion, let me try and set the tone. After the recently concluded COP26, all major countries representing uh, almost 90% of global economy have pledged net zero commitments, underpinning the need for faster and scalable energy transition. Countries all over the world are adopting measures to achieve net zero, which will require significant financing. A joint study by World Economic Forum and Oliver Wyman estimates that roughly $50 trillion in incremental investments is required by 2050 to transition the global economy to net zero emissions. Much of this funding up to 2030 is expected to flow into established technologies. When I say established technologies, I mean conventional renewables. IE also estimates that a bulk of investments over the next decade will flow into electricity generation and grid, as well as electrification of transport systems. Against this backdrop, India has pledged to achieve net zero by 2070 and achieve and various estimates, uh, for example, by CEW, have pegged the total financing requirement in India roughly $10.1 trillion, which is 
say 20% of total funding required globally to achieve net zero. Hence, India will have to play a very major role in adopting and deploying emission abatement technologies in the path to net zero. Accordingly, India has set an ambitious target of achieving 50% energy from non-fossil fuels by 2030. Apart from positive climate impact, clean energy transition is also an economic multiplier through the development of infrastructure and creation of jobs as the country pivots to a greener future. Approximately $70 billion uh, have been invested in renewable energy across the country in the past six or seven years. Various estimates suggest that the country needs investment of roughly $400 billion from 2023 to 2030. That is about $60 billion per year to reach 450 gigawatt of renewable capacity and corresponding transmis transmission network augmentation. This presents a huge massive financing opportunity for domestic and foreign investors. It is estimated that the present clean energy funding is roughly 14 billion per year, only a small part of what is required. Hence, majority of funding will have to be met through newer sources of finance. India has achieved fifth global position in solar power deployment. Solar power capacity has increased almost 17 times in the last seven years from 2.6 gigawatt to say 45 gigawatt in 2021. And our total solar plus wind capacity is roughly 100 gigawatt. This capacity addition has been mainly financed by uh, you know, domestic uh, sources as also FDI inflows of say about $10 billion. While more established clean energy segments such as utility scale solar and wind energy have established business cases and models in India and have grant have gained access to mainstream financing. Other clean energy uh, solutions uh, still struggle as they often do not have the scale or demonstrated business models to attract uh, the kind of investment they need. To conclude, it is clear that the battle against climate change will be won in countries like China and India. At the same time, we need to meet aspirations of our young population and for that development is real must. However, so far, no country, including China, has managed to lift itself out of poverty without a corresponding surge in emissions. So India has an arduous task to become a more prosperous country without putting out enough carbon to break the world. Good news is that all of this can be done. It will indeed require billions, if not trillions of dollars. But it is still a small sum of money when you look at global GDP of 80 trillion or the global annual savings of 20 trillion. Bear in mind that bulk of what is needed is investment and not grants. The investment that can generate returns. So India presents this unique opportunity of scale and adequate returns across different investment categories. So let me just uh, stop here and uh, over to you, Watsila. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sidhwani, for integrating such a nice vision and uh, integrating it with economics. So uh, for special remarks, I invite Mr. Sujoy Bose, Managing Director, CEO of National Investment and Infrastructure Fund. Thank you, Vatsala, and uh, thank you, Terry, for giving me this opportunity to participate in this great panel of, on a topic that is very close to my heart. Now, um, what, uh, what I want to do is really actually start with a story from my previous, um, you know, from my previous uh, company that I used to work for, which is the International Finance Corporation. I uh, worked there for 25 years, uh, you know, and I was uh, working all over the world um, uh, on uh, uh, many infrastructure uh, sectors, including power. Now, the interesting story that I wanted to just start with is, so IFC started investing in renewable energy uh, probably in the mid-2000s, uh, probably, uh, you know, uh, started with small, small projects, and then over time, uh, things picked up. And at that time, there was a very dear friend of mine in IFC who was the head of the power department. And there was obviously a lot of push from the top because, uh, you know, development finance, uh, renewable energy at that time was the hot topic. There was a lot of push from the top to do more in renewable energy. And my friend, who was the head of the power group, basically once said, you know, this is a, this is a terrible, uh, it's a terrible risk only over my dead body. <laughs> right. So, uh, but anyway, we we several of us convinced him that you know it is good to take some risk at that point of time, and over time, IFC became one of the largest financiers and investors in the renewable energy sector and emerging markets. Still, 
till my you know till my other friend pushkar over here and you know some of his uh, uh, his compatriots in the pension funds and sovereign funds started uh, taking this uh, on stream but the more important part of the story is that friend of mine who at that point of time wanted to die before he would uh, finance and invest into renewable energy recently launched a fund and the first investment in his fund is a renewable energy project in india and it basically tells the story of how the world has progressed and how uh, the sector has started from something that was a small innovation at that point of time uh, you know a, a alongside large capacities around the world in thermal and hydro and and other uh, and other sources of energy to becoming a mainstream today uh, of how we think of making electricity and i think this whole uh, whole um, uh, discussion of financing of uh, you know of of uh, clean energy of the energy transition actually has two parts one is how we make electricity and then how we use energy right and and that's really what the way we could uh, we could think about this this discussion and and really if i think about renewable energy which at that point of time you know when uh, when I'm, my story uh, happens Uh, it was an innovation today it is mainstream 25% of energy uh, of india's uh, electricity generation capacity is actually in renewables but it's a very interesting sector because we've already built around 100 gigawatts of uh, renewable energy capacity in india by the way there are countries such as denmark who on certain days they run their entire electricity requirements from offshore wind 100% renewable energy gener uh, you know electricity generation but in india we we built 100 gigawatts of uh, of renewables but the country's objectives is to get to 450 or 500 gigawatts so we still have 400 gigawatts to build over the next few years now what does it mean on the financing side so on the financing side many of us who are in, who are participants in this sector we are very proud 15 billion dollars of equity has been raised for this sector over 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 the last uh, decade let's say guess what it's it's a news for all of us is 65 billion more of equity investment is required to get to that to, to that target of 500 gigawatts right so while we've come a long way and renewable energy today looks like mainstream financing we we understand how to how to price it we understand what the risks are we understand what's good and what's not Uh, we understand how to think about capacity of generation etc we are still looking at a very long runway uh, in terms of where we need to get to 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 actually achieve stability but and and by the way even in the renewable energy uh, area uh, and and I'll focus on india while there are certain and now i'm moving a little bit from the equity side to the to the debt side while on the financing side there are players who are quite familiar with financing of renewable energy it's still a small number and more importantly ultimately a sector such as renewable energy needs to be financed by the capital markets capital markets in india still not that used or that familiar with financing of renewable energy so all this is going to change and it's going to be a fascinating decade ahead of us as we as we go through this journey of uh, of energy transition but even while we are taking a relatively mature sector and helping it stabilize and mature even more guess what i mean this energy transition is all about innovation as well so not only are we now generating electricity but now we are thinking of how to store it and how to finance the storage of this <laughs> of this electricity right so are we going to store it through batteries are we going to store it through pumped hydro are we going to you know uh, have other ways of storing this electricity uh that is generated through renewable energy still figuring it out still figuring it out all this money that we are putting into capex that we are putting into some of the this innovation will it actually pan out will investors uh you know be able to um uh, get a decent return out of these very large uh, you know capex heavy projects uh and this is where i think several of us are trying um you know to ensure that we can create an ecosystem both on the equity side and by the way it is going to being led currently on the equity side because it is still in the innovative uh, area because and, and hence you know the returns early on will be higher with additional risk as well 
But over time, hopefully these sectors such as storage, such as batteries and, and, and so on will, will settle down and also become what renewable energy generation uh, is today. So that's a lot on, on, I would say, generation of electricity, on, on storage of electricity, and then we come to the usage, usage and that's where mobility uh, starts coming into play. And there are, there's so much work going on around the world, including in India, on mobility. And, and there's clearly uh, mobility uh, shifting. By the way, I, I don't know if you guys read this article that in Europe, you know, in Europe, diesel cars were always really popular. Last year, there were more electric vehicles sold in Europe than diesel cars. And that is also, again, a clear indication of the trend of what we will see around the world. Uh, Europe has led on the renewable side, and it's now leading on the EV side as well. Uh, but as this transition happens on the usage of energy in India uh, and electric vehicles, uh, electric mobility, uh, usage of renewable energy in the, ho in the homes, all of this starts picking up. In other words, uh, decarbonization of the economy, there's going to be tremendous opportunity uh, and very interesting, I would say, learning curves on the uh, financing side. Uh, there will be need, like we saw on the renewable energy side, there will be need for public support. Uh, on the, uh, there will be need for uh, innovator, inno innovators to come in and entrepreneurs to come in and try new ideas. Um, there will be need for a lot of equity. And over time, uh, lenders will have to step in to actually then finance scaling of, of all these ideas. And finally, the capital markets at some point will become the biggest funders. Actually, frankly, I think the capital markets will also fund some of the innovation, uh, as we have seen in the West as well, uh, on this front. Um, and again, uh, I think we are going to have uh, we are going to have a tremendous, uh, tremendous few years of uh, of innovation, of entrepreneurism, of learning, of some risk taking. Because you know, in this kind of en environment, we have to be prepared that not everything will succeed. Um, you know, we have the, the, the classical example of the VHS and beta, beta cam, if I remember right, the, the video cassettes. We will go through some of those uh, choices also in this energy transition. Let me take a couple of minutes just to talk a little bit about what NIF is doing uh, on this front. Uh, and we have been trying to um, uh, both do a lot of stuff in terms of the investment side and also play a leadership role on the on the on the on the thought uh, on the thinking and the uh, and the innovation side and also the by the way the policy side uh, in terms of what we are on the investment side we we have together with a couple of partners we have a very fast growing renewables platform this is a classic wind solar hydro kind of a platform currently we are at about 2.6 gigawatts of total capacity 1.2 already operating a very good team and they're doing a great job um, we just tied up with uh, with a storage company, with a pumped hydro storage company, to try to get to round-the-clock kind of uh, uh, offers uh, uh, in terms of renewable energy. I think one of the big items in the renewable energy side is going to be to generate firm power. So today, most of the renewable energy generation is infirm, but I think companies who figure out how to how to produce and 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 you know uh, provide firm power will actually create a, a whole new generation of uh, uh, of companies uh, in, in this in this field we've also created uh, we are very proud that we anchored the green growth equity fund uh, which i'm sure several of you are aware of at 740 million dollars and with some really marquee investors this fund has now become perhaps the single largest uh, single country focused climate fund anywhere in the world outside oecd mar markets uh, and with 740 million dollars of equity GGF can actually do a lot of interesting things, and they are already they are doing e-mobility, they are doing um, waste to energy, they are doing um, water treatment. So they finance a really interesting, uh, invested in a really interesting project under the Namami Ganga uh, scheme, where uh, you know it's a project in West Bengal that will treat almost 15% of the sewage that goes from uh, that is uh, you know uh, in West Bengal that is that goes into the Ganga. So it, it's the whole you know process of cleaning this up. Uh, and we've also invested in a smart meters company because we do believe that energy efficiency and being able to measure usage of electricity is also going to be very crucial in the whole ecosystem of this energy transition. Finally, what uh, we, you know, we've done two other things which I'm also very pleased about. One is um, we've created a um, 
uh, a, a group called the Green Frontier. And in this Green Frontier, we have policymakers, we have um, uh, you know, uh, entrepreneurs who are working on the e-mobility side, we have uh, large companies, financiers, et cetera, uh, where we are trying to come up with ideas, uh, you know, inputs into policy, et cetera, um, for, the, um, for the green uh, ecosystem. Uh, and finally, uh, in case you didn't, I, I, you know, you may have seen, but we recently announced that together with IIM Ahmedabad, uh, we are going to have a NR chair for ESG uh, in uh, IIM Ahmedabad's uh, new uh, research uh, 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 school. So we are very, I think this is the first, first time something like this has been done in India. And what it basically shows us, shows is that we also want to take the lead on the academic thinking on this transition to the green frontier. So with all the, with that, again, very pleased to be here and uh, look forward. This is a great panel, so I'm not going to take up more time, but really try to um, you know, participate in this panel and listen also to the other panelists uh, on this really interesting topic. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Sajoy. Definitely carbon neutrality or the green growth is an opportunity for all of us, be it uh, in technological innovation or financing innovation. We have come a long way and we still have a long way to go. I now hand over the mic to our moderator, Mr. Pankaj Sidhwani. Over to you, thank sir. You, Vatsala. Thank you, Vatsala. And thank you, Sujoy, for such comprehensive overview. Uh, you know, my job is uh, difficult. We have such stellar panel. So we'll try and see um, how uh, you know most of the questions can get covered in the uh, span of next about uh, 60 minutes. So let me start with you, Sujoy, although you've alluded to it uh, partially, but given uh, the uh, the work that NIF has begun to do in the area of uh, energy transition uh, through its funds and through its platform companies, could you just tell us what are the specific ambitions of NIFR? I mean, given that the India, uh, given that the needs of India are huge, what specific role NIF has in mind, both in medium and long term? In, in this India's energy transition story. Thanks for that, Pankaj. Um, look, um, NIF is going to be one player in a really big uh, market opportunity and a big, really large transition. And I think the 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 role that we could really play in, in is catalytic. And and given given that we are it ourselves a public-private partnership. With very strong, uh, I would say, uh, you know, partnership, uh, not partnership, but sponsorship of the government, uh, and being at kind of uh, uh, the the uh, uh, where uh, you know government thinking policymakers come into interaction with very large foreign investors, the financial uh, institutions in India, uh, of entrepreneurs who we are investing in, of fund managers who we are working with, it puts us in a in a zone where we can actually bring, we can listen to all these various ideas, bring them together, try to make a few investments ourselves, but really try to create an ecosystem uh, that supports the transition uh, to green. And, and, and that's why, you know, as I mentioned, we've also started playing, trying to focusing on the thought leadership aspect, on the academic uh, leadership aspect of some of these areas. One simple, simple concept, right? Green financing, we talk so much about green financing, but the definition of what is green financing is still ambiguous. True. And if you know people around this table, several of us can play a role in the taxonomy of what is green, what, how will we actually um, ensure that the green financing, a green bond is really used for green financing or green projects? You know, these kinds of aspects can make a huge impact on the ecosystem. I'm very pleased about the Green Growth Equity Fund because that is a clear indication that India now has its own climate fund. And this climate fund is actually supported by the Global Climate Facility, uh, a large insurance company such as Zurich, uh, you know, and, and so there's, there's a lot of, uh, and there's Indian, uh, you know, a combination of Indian public money, multilateral money through NIF, there's, uh, uh, you know, the UK's uh, FCDO, which used to be DFID, which is also uh, an investor in that fund. So it's basically you have UK, Dutch, you know, GCF, which is global. You have a German insurance company. It's really an interesting, uh, uh, you know, uh, sorry, Allianz, not Zurich. I should correct that. Uh, uh, there's a there's a real 
you know, it's coming together of very important players uh, to signal that that investing into uh, you know the climate space in India is important, and it also creates a demonstration impact around the world and also in the in the local economy. And and I would like if if I were to have a choice, then that's really what NIF should be doing, which is playing that catalytic role, bringing people together, listening to different views, finding. Uh, how those views can be uh, can be uh, uh, executed, both in terms of policy, not 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 execution policy, but in, you know we can at least feedback to policy makers how it can be executed in terms of investment, in terms of creating funds, and so on and so forth. Catalytic indeed. Thank you. That very interesting. Uh, let me now turn to Pushkar. Pushkar, I mean, I, I understand, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong. CPP has set an ambitious target of increasing its um, you know, portfolio, global portfolio from $500 billion to roughly about $750 billion by 2028. Uh, do you see India as a major contributor to uh, this growth? And what share would you like to see from within this for energy transition? Uh, thanks, Pankaj. And uh, thanks uh, to all my other panelists. Uh, maybe let me just start with two lines about CPP investments. So we are Canada's largest pension fund. Uh, we are owned by the Canadian <coughs> government, but run uh, like a private sector entity uh, with a single objective to maximize return for our uh, contributors without undue risk of loss. Uh, within, this, uh, within this very specific mandate, we obviously are uh, extremely aligned with the global ambitions of a net zero or the 1.5 degree uh, temperature cap by 2050. Uh, to that end, uh, we very recently made our pledge for uh, our portfolio being net zero by 2050. Uh, and, and, and some of the aspects of that uh, are now uh, made public. Uh, today, as we speak, uh, we have within the 540 billion Canadian dollars of uh, assets under management, we have about 67 billion dollars invested in direct uh, sort of uh, renewable energy stroke transition assets, and we expect that by 2030. And let me take that as a as a specific uh, year uh, when our fund will become about a trillion dollars. Uh, we expect those investments to grow to about 130 billion Canadian dollars. Uh, and, and our goals are across scope one, scope two, uh, uh, you know, emission reductions. Uh, coming closer to India, uh, we've been here for about uh, 10 years now. Uh, we have invested roughly about uh, 1 lakh crores in the Indian markets across various uh, various uh, you know capital markets infrastructure uh, renewable energy uh, real estate and so on and so forth uh, and we expect that uh, this uh, investments will continue to grow we do not make any specific targets but we want to be extremely aligned to india's ambition of uh, moving towards a carbon neutrality uh, so we are here to stay and uh, we expect that the percentage of investments, which is about two and a half to three percent today, uh, likely move towards four to five percent over a period of time uh, as India continues to grow. Sure, sure. Thanks for that, uh, Pushkar. Uh, very interesting. Uh, let me uh, now turn to Cecilia and uh, you know ask her. You know, India has announced net zero ambitions by 2017, right? Uh, do you see India getting there? And if yes, what do you think is needed uh, to help India get there? Okay. Thanks very much for this question. I'd like to thank the organizers for, for inviting me to, to join this, this very impressive panel. Um, you know, excellent question. I, I consider myself an optimist, and you know, the work of the OECD is really to support members um, and key partner countries on reaching these very ambitious global targets. So I would really have to say, yes, I think India can meet its net zero target by 2070. It is very far away. I mean, we're talking almost 50 years, so I, I would hope that uh, we can remain optimistic about this. 
Uh, most countries in the emerging and developing economies have slightly earlier net zero targets. So this is also another reason why I think um, it is going to be possible. We have seen good progress in terms of uh, development of different low carbon uh, transition technologies on both the supply and demand side. Um, so I think there is a good reason to be optimistic uh, from a technology development perspective, but also from you know a, a policy perspective, a COP26, um, there were a lot of very positive announcements from key emerging players, not only India, but also from uh, many of the ASEAN economies. Um, and also, you know, I think a very strong commitment from uh, OECD and developed countries to support uh, key emerging and developing economies in their transition. And I think this all leads to very uh, favorable scenarios on that. On top of that, uh, you also have what's happening uh, within the financial markets uh, side. A lot of uh, activity in the last um, years and focused on uh, between um, in different institutional investors on, on greening portfolios, strong commitments uh, to be um, Paris compliant and Paris aligned in portfolios. Uh, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. I think a lot of people are looking at how to make these sort of uh, commitments, targets uh, a reality. Um, what are the tools that, that we need to develop to, to see the, the flows of capital? But I think all of this momentum is extremely positive. And, and maybe just the, the final word that uh, we also see great progress on the, the corporate side, um, not just uh, multinationals from OECD countries, but uh, large Indian multinationals and conglomerates who are uh, making strong commitments to this change. Um, what we need to also see happen is, you know, clear policy signals, the right type of uh, enabling policies to really help support and drive that transition, uh, including on, on the finance side of things. Thanks. Sure. Thanks, Cecilia. Let me now turn to Girish. Uh, Girish Sujay earlier talked about, uh, you know, uh, energy generation aspect, and then he talked about uh, you know, the application. He talked about energy efficiency, e-mobility, and so on and so forth. So what do you think is going to be uh, the, the, the landscape 10 years down the line? In 2030, for example, other than the mainstream solar or wind, what new sectors do you think will emerge in next eight or 10 years? So uh, certainly, as uh, Mr. Bose rightly highlighted, that energy uh, transition to renewables is structural. I mean, before I come to those sectors, let me just point out the clear fact that, you know, the overall investment outlook is quite positive in the uh, renewable segment, thanks to the policy focus through 500 gigawatt of target by 2030, and thanks to net zero, you know, targets by 2070. I mean, we are going to see a very, very massive investment push you know, uh, even by 2030, in our own estimates, in fact, the investment requirements are going to be at least 450 to 500 billion dollars, you know, to augment the renewable capacity to 500 gigawatt, which will also include the investments required for augmenting the TND infrastructure and also to ensure the storage capacity. In fact, even between 2030 and 2070, even if we have to assume, let's say, India were to grow at, say, let's say, at a conservative rate of, let's say, 3 to 4 percent annually, uh, and in, if assuming India were to meet at least 80% of RE, you know, transition by 2070, India will require another massive, you know, capacity addition in the renewable space, you know, cumulatively uh, to touch about uh, closer to 4,000 gigawatts. So we are talking of a multiple factor of 8x, 8 to 9x, even between 2030 and 2070. So in that context, even the annual RE capacity addition, even the conventional RE capacity addition will be required to the extent of 90 to 100 gigawatt every year. So we are really talking about a very, very massive investment push in the conventional renewable energy segment itself. I mean, I mean that segment itself will attract lots of investment attention. If you look at overall you know, carbon uh, emission intensity for India, almost 45 to 50 percent of the carbon emission is actually accounted by the energy sector, by the power sector, followed by the industrial segment, which largely captures anywhere between 25 to 30 percent. 
and then the transport sector which currently captures anywhere between 12 to 15 percent so these are the three sectors which actually account for the overall carbon emission intensity so the lot of action is first required in the conventional renewable space followed by you know various energy efficiency you know measures uh, 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 which are required to be adopted by a key industrial you know segments likes of iron and steel and cement for example and in fact we we have we have started seeing a very very you know encouraging trends you know from the leading players in these sectors like iron and steel and cement in terms of adopting you know the energy efficiency you know measures through use of uh, you know the waste heat recovery based uh, you know uh, you know the steam generation uh, equipments and uh, also uh, you know very recent announcement of even the carbon capture you know storage technologies you know by some of the prominent players in these uh, business so certainly the energy efficiency measures carbon capture technologies will get slowly adopted you know by the industries uh, particularly in the iron and steel and cement followed by uh, a massive push towards uh, e mobility electrification as far as the mobility is concerned uh, and that itself has started uh, uh, seeing good amount of traction as far as the e scooters are concerned e buses are concerned which is uh, showing a very good traction uh, much ahead of you know the uh, uh, e uh, passenger vehicles in our own forecast i mean the, the traction as far as the ev segment is concerned for the passenger vehicles it will lag uh, you know uh, uh, with a certain rate i mean we are expecting 10 to 15% you know penetration in a best possible scenario by 2030 assuming other factors to play out in terms of charging infrastructure and roll out of uh, you know the models by the various oems etc but certainly the e scooters uh, e buses and e lcd segment you know will capture more attention more investments in the first place followed by the e passenger vehicle so a lot of uh, investments and ev entire ev ecosystem will also require a massive investments because that itself is going to be a structural change as far as the mobility is concerned so certainly besides the conventional renewables we will see number of investments happening in the energy efficiency dynamics for the iron and steel cement followed by parallelly massive investments in the ev ecosystem as such we are also going to you know see a massive investment as far as uh, you know the biofuels particularly you know the blended uh, you know ethanol requirements are concerned and uh, that's where you know over the next 3 to 5 years significant investments are also going to be there as well as the ramp up of uh, distillery capacities are concerned various prominent sugar players have already announced significant investment plans uh, as far as the distillery capex is concerned so th there are number of investments which are going to be there in various uh, sectors uh, as i just outlined conventional renewables uh, uh, industrial sector and the e-mobility yeah thank you girish uh, namita let me now turn to you you are the esg expert on the panel so do you see any changes in the investors perspective specifically on esg and how can india leverage it uh namita you seem to be on mute sorry sorry about that uh, thank you very much, Pankaj, for the question, and thanks, Terry. That's what I was saying. So, you know, to answer your question, for years, sustainability issues have been a secondary concern for investors. But now, institutional investors, pension funds have grown too large to diversify away from systemic risks and have started to consider ESG impact of portfolios. Today, what we see is large investors, portfolio managers, and sell-side analysts are engaging heavily on ESG, that is, gradually going mainstream i wouldn't say it's become mainstream but it's gradually going mainstream and uh, to quote a number a record 649 billion us dollars poured into esg focused funds uh, worldwide through uh, you know the entire 2021 up till 12, november um, 30th and this accounts for 10 percent of worldwide funds uh, assets right so this is obviously demonstrating that ESG is upending the world of finance and uh, projections also show that ESG assets may surpass 41 trillion US dollars by the end of this year, accounting for almost one third of the projected total AUM globally by 2025. So this is top of the mind agenda for the financial sector, especially for asset managers. However, 
what we're seeing is that there is an increased mismatch that is observed between what fund managers are telling ESG clients and their actual allocation strategies, especially in Europe. And this has come to light since the SFDR has kicked in. That is the uh, Sustainable Finance Disclosure Regulation, right? And, um, you know, what is the EU doing? They, uh, through the SFDR, the EU is enforcing and al aligning sustainability requirements. So even if this anti-greenwash rule book is um, being put, it's far from being watertight. So at the end of last year, vast majority of funds claims carried the Article 8 label under the SFDR, which is under the light green category that allows investment managers the freedom to decide what to include in a particular fund. And this is believed to have laid the basis of unsubstantiated ESG claims. In fact, asset managers are currently allocating more than seven times as much money to Article 8 in comparison to SFDR's stricter green category of Article 9. Coming to India, I think to avoid a situation created in the EU, it will be very important for us in our country to have very strong guidelines introducing minimum standards framework to rigorously monitor the ESG market by regulators and clearly articulating investment objectives and policies that integrate ESG by investors. I think given the immense po uh, potential and the upcoming demand of ESG investments, I think this is the first thing that is desired to be done so that there's no clutter or there's no greenwashing or whatever that you call, I mean, opportunities for all of that, right? And um, I think uh, Sujoy mentioned that the cumulative investment requirement is almost uh, 10 trillion, or you mentioned, uh, in sectors like energy. And while there is a strong intent by government of India towards energy transition, I think the need, a need to create an alleyway to attract ESG focused global capital would be very, very desired. So, you know, an example on the debt side, bond instruments are very well suited to fund um, RE projects, renewable energy projects. Um, they will provide long term capital at competitive rates raised from diverse set of investors. I mean, we saw how one of the latest, which was Adani Electricity Mumbai raised over 300 million US dollars and issuing a long term 10 year sustainability linked bond uh, with global investor participation. Right. And then, uh, you know, the uh, one big thing, significant thing that has happened is India's announcement of issuance of green, uh, the sovereign green bond. This would really provide the much needed impetus to scale up and catalyze the local green bond market and attract new investors. What we've seen is over the last one year, the last uh, at year, 12 months, the issuances that have happened, these are more from corporate side and not so much from the financial institution side. So this kind of uh, sovereign green bond, apart from bringing in liquidity, uh, it would you know validate the green bond or the ESG market in India. Um, leading to strong bids, larger order books, increased pricing leverage, as well as a higher quality um, as far as the investor base is concerned, right? And then my last point is on the equity side. You know, asset level monetization is imperative for renewable energy companies to keep recycling capital from operational projects to under construction projects. And then Pooled investment vehicles, and we're talking about innovations, right, in finance. So pooled investment vehicles like the uh, in, in the infrastructure investment trusts, uh, these can be leveraged as they will allow companies to monetize operational cash generating assets by pooling multiple assets under a single entity. A good example is uh, India's first uh, renewable energy in which uh, the Verisant uh, Renewable Energy Trust, which raised $62 million recently from a Canadian fund, right? So I think such products can go to scale exponentially and materialize investments in the near future. So India really has the opportunity to leverage these towards the energy transition needs, which include renewable energy, um, uh, you know, the um, storage uh, needs that are there or mobility for that matter. And, uh, you know, while domestic sources are there, they could be uh, they could be also offshore investments, debts, equity alike, which can help secure low cost and um, tenured kind of financial um, financing for renewable energy assets and this whole transition. Thank you. Thanks, Namita. Let me come back to you, Sujoy, and, uh, you know, there is a lot to be uh, hopeful for, and almost each one of us has evinced that sense of optimism. But if you look at the uh, the, the gap that we have, uh, we earlier spoke about 
you know, roughly half a trillion dollars being needed over next decade, right? So, and so far what we have uh, invested is say 70, 80 billion dollars. So there's a huge ramp up required. Do you think we'll be able to attract uh, this kind of capital? And if yes, uh, you know, how will we be able to do that? And more specifically, since you've been speaking with uh, investors both in India and abroad, and you earlier spoke about the catalytic nature of NIF, how do investors view India and India opportunity? Uh, great, great question. And you've asked me three, four different questions in, in <laughs> one. So let me try, let me try my best to cover cover all of them. And maybe to take a step back and really talk about, and this is, of course, what we do at the end of the day, which is infrastructure development, right? Now, when you look at infrastructure development, uh, governments around the world, every government wants to realize very quickly that the infrastructure needs are way beyond the capability of the government itself. And it needs to attract in private capital, um, multi, you know, development capital, et cetera, into infrastructure building, uh, you know, to to make it happen. Because otherwise, uh, the government, you know, every government has a lot of money that goes into social, you know, social requirements to manage to uh, pay for its own debt, et cetera, et cetera. So what's left over for infrastructure is not enough, uh, uh, given you know the population growth, the economic growth, et cetera. And in India, we also, you know, need predictability on energy. We need, uh, you know, reduction of logistics costs, et cetera, et cetera. So what the government typically tries to do is, uh, all, all governments try to do is to attract in private capital. But then what, what we will have to look at is what does that private capital really want? Because private capital around the world, not just in India, uh, and, and when I say private capital, I include, um, you know, funds like Pushkar's, uh, which is, you know, the large pension funds, sovereign funds around the world, because this is commercial, commercial capital, right? This is capital seeking commercial returns. Um, typically, what happens is that they prefer to avoid large scale infra greenfield infrastructure development, because large scale infra greenfield infrastructure development has lots of risks, not just the construction risk, you know, and the development and construction risk. But also, when you build projects, um, you need to have certainty that you know users will come. So if you build a port, you don't really know if ships will come, right? If you build an airport, you still don't know if planes will come. On the other hand, renewable energy has an advantage. And renewable energy has an advantage because you're typically uh, building renewable energy projects on the back of PPAs, on power purchase agreements, which reduce the uh, the offtake risk, and by the way, I'll come to the strategies. But of course, there, the the I, I really think the turning point for the sector in India was SECI, was the Solar Energy Corporation of India and NTPC coming up with standardized auction processes, providing offtake arrangements, reducing the risk of land acquisition through solar parks, providing connectivity to the grid. So literally, all the risks related to greenfield projects were covered, and they provided a kind of an offtake arrangement that helped backstop the credit risk of the uh, of the discounts. So, um, so, so commercial investors are very okay to take that kind of risk, and hence I think um, the the power sector from that standpoint, particularly um, the renewable energy sector, has an advantage uh, over other kinds of uh, infrastructure building. And hence, what I, I I think we have to the way we need to do it which is what the government is trying to do, is perhaps focus more of the government's own resources on greenfield projects that are in other sectors where commercial capital is less likely to go and actually look to attract more commercial capital into this sector, uh, into the renewable energy sector uh, uh, at scale. And if we can, and, and there are obviously in India, there are concerns related to the off -taker, uh, you know, the offtake uh, predictability of distribution companies, the credit worthiness of distribution companies, et cetera, putting structures like SECI, NTPC offtake there makes a huge difference. Uh, and, and I think, uh, and, and I'll go beyond the, beyond the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the renewable energy sector. I mentioned that we had done, uh, you know, a, a fund has invested in a project, a Namami Ganga project. And even the schemes like the Namami Ganga scheme, where there is a offtake support from a central government, you know, pool of funds to municipalities, to local bodies, to states, uh, I think that's a very good way of um, 
of uh, of pushing forward this 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 challenge now and and connected to that is to scale the ultimate price at which you sell the power or you sell the storage facilities is crucial so the key is to find very you know a, a very quick kind of a curve on the on on, on the uh, a very quick cost curve that's coming down and if you look at if you go by solar and wind what happened over there was the initial reduction in the cost curve was because of technology uh, then it were, it was because of scale because as production facilities started to scale the cost of producing these modules came down and finally it was because of smart smart procurement and smart smart procurement by government and in india it's really uh, it's not necessarily subsidies but it's a bit of a different kind of policy support you know by uh, by uh, prioritizing the the usage the consumption of renewable energy once you once you have cost stabilizing at a level which you know there are customers for that is when financing comes in at scale and when financing comes in at scale that say then you get into a uh, what should i say a, a, a virtuous circle where you are continuously and with scale comes even further reduction in prices reduction in financing cost etc uh, and that's really what what kicks off the sector and and i think the renewable energy sector is a brilliant example of this the early investors uh, and we were you know i was a part of an institution that was an early investor they made actually very good returns from their early investments uh, they helped scale the sector up then returns stabilized you know the whole uh, uh, kind of the uh, the understanding of the sector stabilized and then you're getting you know then then the bond market started to play a role uh, and now you know you have you have even uh, indian renewable energy companies listing you know uh, in, not just in india but outside the country so i i'm very confident that the other sectors that we spoke about are all going to follow suit uh, and 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 in 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 this in this transition there are some sectors that are not going to work out right and and those sectors we will they will not be able to scale and that's fine that's part of any transition that's part of any uh, you know uh, innovation uh, uh, where some things will not work out but net net like i think several of us are saying over here the core areas of this energy of the core sectors in this energy transition i am actually very optimistic that financing um, will will be there to help these sectors to scale and I, I think what we are seeing some of the large groups in India are doing, you can see that the large groups are gearing up to invest capital and enable this transition to happen. So all in all, I'm optimistic. Thank you for that, Sujay. I fully agree with you. I mean, India has leveraged uh, scale and its ability to aggregate demand very, very well. Fully agree. Pushkar, uh, let me turn to you. And I'm sure you and Sujoy are anyway doing your bit uh, to help do that. But my question was, what more can you do to leverage your own experience in India and help crowd in investment from other pension and sovereign funds? We know, I mean, there are a lot of <clears throat> investment from uh, within Canada, but the amount of money which is out there, India can do with uh, much more. Mm -hmm. So what specifically institutions such as uh, yours can do to crowd and capital from uh, uh, similar like-minded investors? That, no, that's, a, that's a great uh, question, Pankaj. And I think uh, prior to sort of detailing into that aspect, I would like to say that one of the, one of the aspects that institutions like ours actually look at is whether the sector as such is self-sustainable. And are there policies and financing uh, or support by the government actually helping the sector move towards self-sustainability. I think we've seen that happen to a large extent in the renewable <clears throat> power generation where power tariffs have come to a level where they are sustainable today and are affordable for people. We would, we would like to see that happen across the value chain. That means I think the key enabler for the tenfold increase in investment we need means uh, discounts have to become sustainable. That also means that manufacturing in India of all the raw material that's required <clears throat> to produce this renewable energy becomes self-sustainable. And are there policy measures being taken by the government 
uh, to actually enable that. The PLI scheme is a great effort in that direction, uh, but that has to spread across multiple other uh, parts of the value chain. I think for large scale capital to come into India and for us to act as uh, enablers of that, uh, one is we, we need to do more uh, sort of thought process alignment with the government, share our experiences from other parts of the world, and also then literally market our experiences to other global investors uh, uh, to help them come in. Uh, we've seen that happen very well in the road sector in India, and that could be taken as a great example of what can be done across not just the renewable energy production, but other parts of uh, uh, you know, the value chain, EV production, battery production, solar cell manufacturing, where also India needs to attain self-sustainability mm -hmm. to be able to reach these uh, mammoth goals that we've taken up upon ourselves. So I think it calls for more dialogue. It calls for joint working groups to actually put their heads together to see how we can attract more investments across the value chain in India. Thank you. Very insightful, Pushkar. Thanks for that. Cecilia, uh, let me uh, ask you uh, <clears throat> a question uh, you know, that we often ask ourselves. And unfortunately, we have not been able to find an answer to that, which is even today, SMEs continue to you know, struggle to find capital to fund their energy transition, right? Uh, you know, all of us are very keen to finance, uh, you know, bigger entities, bigger corporates with sizable balance sheets. But SMEs, which are so very important part of the economy, somehow they still struggle to find capital. And it is extremely important that they are in an intrinsic part of the energy transition. What do you think can be done to mitigate that? Um, thanks very much for this question, and, and I completely agree that we need to to look and support um, SME development for the the energy transition. Um, if you look at you know some of the past experience on promoting energy efficiency in an SME and helping them to to raise finance, I think there's a lot to be learned from uh, many of the past programs that have been implemented from by different uh, development partners such as JICA. Uh, the World Bank, ADB, where um, there has been quite a lot of support, knowledge building, uh, capacity building, awareness raising uh, that has been provided, which has led to some good support. Uh, we've also seen um, a number of uh, uh, impactful on lending programs that have been uh, worked through with, with SIDBI. Um, I think some of the there are many lessons that can be learned from this past experience. Uh, one of the issues we found has been um, that a, a lot of these programs um, they are starting to have an impact, and then they need to start reporting and or wrapping up. So we need to find a way to really implement programs that are learning from past experience. Um, but I think a lot of the experience is is out there. Uh, we are uh, under our clean energy finance and investment mobilization program with India, working on a, a clean energy finance and investment roadmap, where uh, the Bureau of Energy Efficiency have asked us to support and looking specifically at, at you know, identifying what are some of the uh, innovative financing solutions that can be implemented to support uh, energy efficiency adoption by SMEs. Uh, this can also apply to a uh, clean energy adoption, so renewables uh, for SME sector as well. Um, and I think here what we need is is also you know a full package of uh, solutions from uh, awareness raising to ensure that there is the demand coming out of the SME sector for uh, investments in uh, energy efficiency as well as uh, uh, renewables. Many of them um, may not necessarily be focusing on the clean energy transition needs, and this is where I think government and other actors have a, a very important role to play in ensuring that that they are focused on on these areas really to, because of um, the supply chain issues. And I think this is an aspect that needs to be um, informed uh, that when we're looking at global supply chains, the SME sector will be an important actor 
in this um, and will also need to consider this as part of their own businesses that they need to shift away from from fossil energy they need to implement uh, energy efficiency and that there are going to be good benefits for that because uh, in our global supply chains they will be looking for suppliers that are are greening and are aware of the and and making uh, investments in the broader energy transition um, uh, on top of that, I think we're, we'll need to look in the Bureau of Energy Efficiency are uh, developing um, a, a, some interesting work around a energy efficiency finance platform. And some of the work of development partners has gone to establishing um, technology lists to make it much easier for financial institutions to know uh, what is a good energy efficiency or a clean energy investment. So I think um, uh, standard protocols as well as uh, standard documentation to make it easier for SMEs as well as their uh, capital providers will help to unlock um, some of the, uh, the capital that we'll need for supporting uh, SMEs in, in the transition as, as well. So it's really going to be a combination of uh, awareness building and providing the right types of standardized protocols, tools, uh, aggregation models that can help um, scale up uh, capital for uh, SME investments as, as well. Um, uh, and maybe just a, a final point around looking also at the role of, of ESCOs uh, that might be able to play in terms of addressing these issues of, of capacity and scale, because one of the biggest challenges around SME investing is that they are very small, uh, which means very high transaction costs. So work around standardization to reduce transition costs will be very important. And I think um, ESCO models that can provide standardized contracting terms can really help in, in this space. Thank you. Thank you, Cecilia. Thank you very much. Girish, uh, let me come to you now. You track the industry and uh, its dynamics on an ongoing basis. What do you think are the key challenges to India's energy transition story and how best they can be mitigated? Yeah, so uh, the first and the foremost uh, you know, challenge as far as the renewable energy transition uh, sector is concerned is going to be uh, you know, the financial <laughs> health of the state distribution utilities. Uh, because the utilities, the state utilities, they are the ultimate top takers in the utility RE sector. And uh, that becomes a big pain point across the value chain as far as Indian power sector is concerned. I mean, that has been the case for a number of decades. Every fifth year, we continue to see some kind of restructuring or a bailout scheme which is coming in, you know, at a policy level, you know, to ensure some kind of, you know, financial turnaround for the state utilities. And uh, we have seen the results so far. It has not worked out. So the underlying problems, you know, for the state utilities, uh, uh, current financial state health is also well known. I mean, the tariffs are not adequate in relation to the cost of supply. There is a high level of operational inefficiencies. ATNC loss levels are significantly higher vis-a-vis -vis the regulatory targets. Subsidy support is not timely, not adequate enough. And uh, more importantly, you know, the tariff determination process has been delayed in number of states. In fact, this year, if you look at only 19 states, you know, there has been an issuance of tariff orders for the state utilities. And uh, within that, only in 11 cases, there are uh, tariff upward revisions for FY22. And the median tariff uh, upward revision is just about 0.5%. And we have seen the average tariff hike over the last uh, five to six year period has remained quite modest. I mean, it has come down from around 4% to less than 1% over the last uh, you know, four to five year period. And uh, on the other hand, we continue to see upward pressure as far as the cost of power supply is concerned for the state-owned distribution utilities, given the fact that you know, the, the, the power purchase cost itself has shown an upward trend. In fact, the cost of power purchase itself is almost 75 to 80 percent share within the entire cost of power supply for the state-owned discoms. And that's where we have seen an upward trend. And in that context, the tariffs are not truly cost reflective. And that's the fundamental reason you know, for the current state of affairs as far as the state utilities are concerned. So, you know, the timely tariff determination process is required. What is ultimately required is a very, very strong and sincere focus and proactive focus 
also by the state governments, you know, to ensure that the state utilities financial health is improved. There are a number of schemes which have been, in fact, recently the, at a policy level, the government of India has also announced a 3.05 lakh crore worth of CAPEX scheme, which is also linked to various milestones. And in fact, 50% of that scheme talks about, you know, the, you know, the significant CAPEX outlay requirement for the smart metering. So the timely implementation of these various CAPEX schemes related to the strengthening of the TND infrastructure, including the IT initiatives and smart metering component, will be very, very important, you know, by the respective state discounts going forward so that their inefficiencies come down, their ATNC loss levels come down sharply. I mean, for every 1% reduction in the ATNC loss level, there is going to be a relief of at least 5,000 crore of, you know, uh, cost as far as planning their distribution utilities are concerned. So that will be a key monitorable. While uh, we just said that, you know, the SICI is an important, uh, you know, uh, intermediary and it has really helped in terms of getting the project awards on the ground. But on the other hand, while SEC is an intermediary, it has got a PPAs on the uh, one hand with the IPPs, while it has got a PSAs on the other hand with the state distribution utilities. And uh, in that context, you know, the, the ultimate uh, improvement in the financial health of the state utilities will be a key important factor. So that's point number one. Point number two is, as we also discussed, is the long tenure debt availability, you know, for the RE projects is going to be very, very important at a very, very competitive rate. I mean, RE project revenue is based on fixed part and single tariffs. So interest rate sensitivity is very, very inherent for the RE projects. So ability to ensure the long tenure debt at a cost competitive rate is going to be extremely important you know, for the RE project developers in the long run. And in, the, in that context, if you look at the overall financing environment for the RE projects, it's still largely dependent on the banks and the NBFCs. Almost 75 to 80% of the debt funding is actually coming from the banks and NBFCs. Although it, the tenures have gone up as as 15 to 20 year door to door, but the reliance on the capital market is still low. The deepening in the bond market is required. Uh, while we have seen a very good traction in the bond market, both locally and internationally off late in the last couple of years, we saw almost $5 billion of you know, dollar bonds getting raised by prominent RE developers in last calendar year, which is a very good sign. We have started seeing emergence of invites, but more of such actions will be required going forward so that you know the, 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 the reliance on the bank capital and the NBFC capital come down and then more diversification in the funding avenues you know, uh, uh, becomes more prominent and that will be a positive trend to see. So that's second. Third, execution challenges. We continue to see, you know, the delays in the land acquisition and the transmission connectivity approvals for number of RE projects, especially more for wind. So in that context, at a policy level, government of India has come out with a solar park scheme almost in way back in 2014, which got amended several times. So in fact, uh, you know, uh, even if you talk about solar park development progress so far, I mean, that uh, development has seen a mixed trend, again, because of delays on the land acquisition front. So we have to see a very, very timely coordination at a policy level between the central government and also various state nodal agencies so that the, the solar parks, you know, availability uh, becomes timely. And that becomes a very classic plug and play model, you know, to get the infrastructure projects within such RE parks because it mitigates the concerns related to the land availability mitigates the concerns related to the transmission infrastructure and the evacuation approvals because of, these are the two important ingredients as far as any RE project is concerned. Yeah. So we will require a very solid, timely progress as far as the solar park development is concerned. That's third. Fourth, we will require a very consistency, a solid consistency in various regulatory and policy level issues. Just to highlight a few more, I mean, the must run status is there as part of the grid code. It's not being implemented in some of the states. That's one. PPA renegotiation is still happening, for example, with respect to the PPAs in AP, where the matter is still uh, yet to be resolved. It's pending for last two years. Fast, fast track resolution of such matters is required both by the regulatory as well as judicial authorities. We have RPO trajectory norms well documented till FY22. Longer RPO trajectory beyond FY22 is required in line with the policy focus uh, right. over the next 50 years. And uh, more importantly, you know, lots of clarity and consistency is also required in terms of the open access charges environment, because that becomes a very regulatory risk for third party open access bits projects as such. So we'll require regulatory and policy consistency apart from some policy stimulus and, you know, clarity on the hydrogen sure. policy, battery storage policy is also required. So these are the four. Sure, sure. Energy transition concern going forward.
Thanks, thanks, Girish. Uh, thanks for that comprehensive overview of uh, the challenges. And I agree specifically the <clears throat> health of discounts and distribution reforms. That is the elephant in the room. Hopefully, we'll come back and discuss that. Uh, Namita, let me turn to you now. You know, and this question is again related to uh, ESG. Do you think industries and investors are pricing in the ESG risks in the investments they are making? And uh, if they aren't, then what do you think needs to be done to, you know, change that? Thanks, uh, Pankaj, for the question. I think, you know, this has started to happen, but it's not an easy task because, you know, ESG as it is a subject is very complex. So, for example, uh, you know, we've seen that ESG is prioritized as a top agenda by <clears throat> government pension funds of, say, Japan, Sweden, Netherlands. Recently, uh, you know, government-backed uh, nest, nest pension scheme of the UK sold all uh, its holdings in major oil and gas companies owing to the latter's uh, lack of climate action. And then we're seeing uh, seeing more of such, um, uh, you know, kind of stands being taken uh, in the uh, in the developed markets, right? Uh, so, uh, you know, this is all suggestive of the fact that investors are flexing their muscles to challenge companies' <laughs> ESG credentials, uh, influencing behavior, and then also looking at whether uh, capital is even being made available or not uh, for that matter. So, you know, like I said earlier, ESG is not a quick fix, and the issues that fall under the purview are also very complex. Having said that, I think it's important to recognize that the very same complexity makes ESG the greatest growth opportunity ever seen by plugging the gaps. So, you know, I would say firstly, the ad hoc nature of ESG integration. I mean, you know, we hear about that ESG needs to be integrated into business strategy, into um, lending decisions, investment strategies, so on and so forth. But I think, uh, you know, the programs that take a siloed approach to operationalizing ESG principles won't really deliver. A company-wide integration of ESG is very central. And then also you know, assigning roles and responsibilities within an organization, because that is also very, very uh, critical uh, for the success of ESG uh, integration. Secondly, I think more needs to be done to frame the success of ESG investments in terms of the impact rather than just the actions that are taken. This would then in turn require disentangling the impact yeah. measurement landscape, which remains, you know, kind of co-founded with matrix. And this is, uh, you know, different kinds of matrix, right? region specific, <clears throat> industry specific, client specific. So all of that. And I think the third area is lack of transparency. Um, uh, which is, you know, um, which is uh, in a way uh, that is well documented as one of the key issues in the market's ability or the investor's ability to accurately price risk. Disclosure is not transparency. For instance, 75% of disclosures look at, um, uh, you know, looked at by, say, SASB kind of frameworks that are not material. 90% of adverse events do not get disclosed. Uh, this speaks yeah. a lot about the lack of transparency in the ESG disclosures, and therefore, then how would investors really look at uh, pricing in that risk? You know? So the need is really uh, to look at ESG in an overarching manner. The shortcomings need to be turned uh, around to enable ESG investing to stand its own ground and not crumble under closer scrutiny or you know under the jargons that are emerging today. So. I would I would say that's that's how one must look sure. at it. That's how investors sure. are looking at it. Thanks. Thanks, Anamita. Thank you so much. So, Joy, let me come back to you. Um, and you partially touched upon it in, in in your opening remarks. You know, for the kind of scale we need, uh, and and on um, you know any which way that class of investment needs to happen. But we've seen, you know, India's takeout finance market is uh, very very shallow. Right, and coupled with that is the fact that the uh, there's a huge asset liability mismatch uh, as far as commercial banks and NBFCs are concerned. Uh, so far, you know, offshore capital markets have played that role to bridge that gap to an extent. What do we need to do to deepen and broaden Indian bond markets? Uh, what could be the role of domestic uh, green bond market in uh, you know financing transition? If you could just uh, uh, elaborate on that. You've touched on one of my favorite topics, so thank you for uh, for bringing that up. Uh, so look, I think uh, in generally in infrastructure, 
Uh, I've always believed that in most of the infrastructure sectors, the bulk of of both investment and financing has to come from domestic capital because right. most infrastructure is a local currency you know uh, business and india has um india is a very interesting country which has a lot of savings uh, in fact if you look at all the domestic savings that are in the institutions such you know in the insurance and uh, and pension uh, and provident fund sectors it's almost a trillion dollars but not most of that doesn't really come into what we call alternative assets, right? I mean, it goes into bank deposits, stock market, gold, um, you know, those kinds of, uh, and, and maybe uh, bonds of PSU, PSU companies and, and, and so on, but it doesn't really come into risk. risk. It doesn't really come into private risk taking, alternative asset risk taking. And, uh, and, and we are really lucky, and, 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 and not lucky, but because of our favorable, very favorable macroeconomic position because of the market, the scale of the market, we are actually quite, you know, we, we, are, we are able to attract foreign investors uh, such as CPP and others, which is fantastic. But um, even the foreign, the international pension funds have often brought up the case that they would like to see Indian pension funds and Indian institutions investing in the same assets that they do right. because before we get to your scale question, because first of all, it stabilizes the sectors. So if there's True. domestic capital and it's if your and my pension money is invested in a project, it is we will fight to protect that project a lot more. You know, uh, we will fight very hard and that will benefit the international <coughs> investors as well. Right. I mean, that, that's ultimately very important. Uh, and by the way, uh, to really scale the capital <coughs> markets, to really on the bond side to really scale the uh, the uh, you know equity investments into uh, alternative assets to uh, to scale the index market the index market is exactly what you said which is take out financing literally for projects that have been developed on the on the equity side um, we must get our local institutions to start taking risk banks are not the right banks are good to finance the greenfield projects but Banks will have exposure limits to groups, to projects, et cetera. And it's very important that once those projects are built, uh, they can actually be taken out by long-term financial capital, uh, ideally a mix of domestic and international uh, money. Uh, a great example of this is Australia. And Australia has done this where it has grown its, um, its, its pension industry, its superannuation in industry in sync with its infrastructure, I would say monetization plan. And, and hence, it's actually worked very well, and it's also attracted in a, so it's, it's the citizens have benefited both from higher returns on their savings, but also from better infrastructure, and, the, and, and, and getting in domestic capital has also attracted and capitalized in international capital. So it's a great example of exactly what you're, what you're mentioning. So I think, you know, I think we've had a good start in actually coming up with a monetization plan. And I'm again, I'm going a little bit beyond just the energy sector, uh, uh, though, uh, uh, you know, a large percentage of that monetization plan is actually in the energy sector. So we've come up with a monetization plan, which is great. Uh, but now I think we have to come up with the ability uh, of domestic capital to, to actually invest into that uh, into that opportunity both on the equity as well as on the financing side. Uh, and I don't know if you guys, um, and, and you know, we, we are very sort of excited about the fact that, uh, so EPFO, for example, used to have a 5% allocation to alternative energy, uh, sorry, to alternative assets, but they had very little invested in alternatives. One of the reasons was they were unable to invest through managers, through third party managers. This was recently changed in the investment pattern, and it's a big step. I, I, not the market didn't really focus on it that much, but I think it's a big step for the future. And the other thing that happened was the insurance under I, uh, IRDA regulations, insurance companies could not invest through fund of funds, and that was changed last year as well. Uh, and that's going to enable creation of fund managers in India, domestic fund managers who can actually do what the large institutions um, want them to do, which is, you know, be the beachhead for, uh, you know, uh, knowledge and, uh, and and track record of these kinds of investments. So, uh, so in my mind, that's the key. The key is to start opening up the domestic, uh, you know, 
savings, uh, you know, investing into alternative assets. As you've seen, uh, invits have become very popular, not just with institutions, but also with with uh, H and I's. And and this is fantastic because you know it's providing uh, in basically savers and investors a yield oriented asset uh, class which previously didn't really exi exist, and it's providing a bit of a spread on government bonds and on PSU bonds. So that's exactly uh, what you would want, uh, and hopefully these projects will do well. So you know the returns will be even higher than what is projected. So it's a it's something that we are really keen to work with, uh, you know, ultimately to enable, uh, you know, institutions uh, such as pension funds, provident funds, um, uh, insurance companies, etc., to come into uh, the infrastructure sector. And the fact that we have the international pension funds, the international sovereign funds, multilaterals already invested in NRF funds should give a lot of comfort to the domestic investors that they are doing this together with the uh, you know, with top expertise from around the world. So hopefully um, that happens in parallel to whatever we're doing on the demand for capital side. Thank you very much, Sujay, for citing those uh, specific examples. Very encouraging. Uh, Pushkar, let me ask you a related question. One very quick thoughts on inwits. So we've seen, as, as uh, Sujay also said, they are increasingly being seen as... Uh, very interesting investment vehicles. So what are your views on Invit? And more importantly, do you see more such structures, more so, more such yield co like structures coming in? And uh, let me continue asking a long-winded question, uh, which is, do you see any structures uh, uh, abroad which could be adapted in geographies like India, right? Which, which could further bring in either, a, you know, a separate class of investors or bring in or bring down the cost of capital? Over to you. No, no thanks, Pankaj. Uh, so, look, I think the genesis of why Invit's Invit regulations were formed, and kudos to SEBI for coming out with this very high quality regulations and amending them time and again as the market develops, right? Uh, but the, the genesis of that was that the taxation on infrastructure investing in India was one of the highest around the world. And there was a need as we want to attract more and more capital to build out our infrastructure, including in the energy side, that we bring down that level of taxation, which is competitive with across the globe. Because finally, when investment committees of global firms like ourselves evaluate investments, they benchmark the returns uh, against the risk that we are taking with uh, peers from across the world. So first and foremost, I think invits have helped bring that down and made Indian investing competitive. Further, the regulations have been fine-tuned over a period of time to ensure whatever the teething issues are uh, to actually make them better and better. On our side, uh, you know, we, we have been part of the Invit journey right from the regulations to actually being one of the first to invest uh, and create a private listed Invit to now uh, investing in the government's monetization program across transmission lines and roads and, and literally be at the forefront of uh, you know, crowdsourcing other uh, like-minded investors uh, to join this invent bandwagon. I think rather than creating other forms of vehicles, I think we need to make invits more and more suitable for wider audience. We need to do a level of education and capacity building so that we see more of EPFO, LIC, uh, local pension funds actually invest uh, in invits alongside um, long-term uh, pension funds and other international bodies. We would love to see more and more HNIs, family offices come into the invit bandwagon. And <clears throat> literally, whatever the efforts are required to make that happen uh, alongside uh, uh, Sujoy and his team, we are willing to do that. Uh, and, and I think we have expressed this to the government. We would love to see more activity happen around it. And uh, happy to share our experiences uh, of investing into the Invit. So I don't think there's a need to create more vehicles. I think our Invit program today is one of the best from around the world. Uh, and, and I think it's here to stay.
Thank you. Thank you, Pushkar. Uh, you know, I'm mindful of the limited time we have, and there's so many more questions that I want to put to this panel. Uh, <clears throat> so maybe, you know, uh, because this is one question I really wanted to ask each one of you, which is if you were to, you know, ask for, I would so ask you for your top three recommendations to, uh, you know, the policy makers or the government or uh, or anyone who matters in this uh, uh, in this energy's India India's energy transition story. What would those three recommendations be? So maybe we can start with uh, Cecilia, then we can go to Girish, uh, Namita, and then finally, uh, you know. Uh, uh, Sujoy and, and Pushkar. So let us start with you, Cecilia. Sure, thanks very much for that. So, you know, if we had three <clears throat> recommendations, I think the first would need to be that we need to ensure the government puts in place very clear and um, realistic targets for the clean energy transition uh, that is really supported by appropriate implementation policies to give uh, investors adequate um, uh, visibility on, on uh, the market going forward to, to really help the mobilization impact. Uh, secondly, I would also stress um, to focus on opportunities for partnerships, uh, potentially through international collaboration. Uh, blended finance could be a, a very interesting uh, potential to uh, try to bring in uh, more of the, the domestic capital. So how can we set up structures that um, provide domestic institutional investors some of this uh, de-risking or uh, comfort that they would need for these first types of, of investments um, and learning from some of the uh, international uh, pension funds and other institutional investors because as, as Pushkar mentions, uh, there's a lot of attractiveness for them to invest alongside with their uh, domestic counterparts. And I think this brings a lot of um, certainty for, for both players. Uh, they can benefit from the international experience um, and perhaps you know, uh, some uh, blended finance uh, vehicle maybe uh, or instrument could help to, to right. bring everyone together and facilitate that. And then finally, you know, uh, to policymakers, as we're looking at this energy transition, we also need to pay attention that what is happening on the sustainable finance side of things through you know taxonomy and other disclosure uh, policies are going to be supportive of uh, the clean energy transition as well because we are really needing a, a clear ecosystem to support uh, sustainable finance uh, sorry clean energy finance and investment and we need to make sure that policies that are being implemented in different parts of government are going to be creating that right ecosystem right. and not creating other barriers. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Girish. And may I request, uh, since we have just two more minutes left, uh, let us try and be as brief as possible. Thank you. Yeah. So very quickly, I mean, three points. One, the clear-cut policy roadmap to incentivize the storage capacity, because storage capacity is going to be extremely critical to integrate the RE uh, in the coming decades. That's one. Number two, clear-cut roadmap. Uh, while there are you know, a number of policy measures to incentivize domestic solar module manufacturing, but clear-cut roadmap and, uh, and the timely action by the, you know, uh, by the various uh, you know, project entities to ensure that these integrated facilities come on time so that India remains self-sufficient in terms of... We've, we seem to have, uh, uh, yes, we lost you in the yeah. middle, probably because of uh, network yeah, issues. Yeah. 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 So, so uh, the last point was that while the power is a concurrent subject, the, the, the policy action and the, the concrete measures by the respective state governments so that the financial health of the state discoms improve. I mean, these are the three points which I would like sure. to highlight. Yeah. Thank you, Girish. Namita? Yeah, so I think my first point is on cost of hedges for attracting foreign capital. I think if the Indian government has shown interest in providing, uh, you know, uh, exchange rate hedging facilities, I think that needs to be ramped up and the design would need to be care carefully considered. 
then i think deepening the capital markets towards that you know uh, some kind of percentage allocation of aums to green bonds or to green finance would go a long way this of course needs to be accompanied by proper disclosures use of proceeds you know mechanism to check the alignment uh, with market practices uh, strengthening capacity of the capital market intermediaries to publish guidance on ESG reporting that's becoming very very critical. This would help include the scope and the needs of stakeholders. And I think lastly, stock exchanges, uh, you know, including segments of dedicated green finance to stock exchanges. I think that will go a, a long way um, to deepen this whole green finance market. So not right. just renewable energy, but I'm just saying overall sure. green finance. Sure. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Navita. Pushkar. I think first and foremost for a institutional uh, investor like ourselves, consistency of policy, super important, uh, and that has to be across across the spectrum. Uh, that's one. Uh, second aspect, I think we need to get policies that will make India self-sustainable, and that is across the value chain. Uh, the importance of that cannot be emphasized more. Uh, it, it is extremely important, and to that end. Uh, policies that will encourage our SMEs, our manufacturing units, to be to become globally competitive, uh, and encourage them to actually adopt best practices to move towards that. I think are are the suggestions that I would give. Thank you, thank you, Pushkar. Final words uh, from you, uh, Sujay. Yeah, I mean, agree with all these points that have been made. So I'm going to try to add three new ones, uh, which is difficult within this group. <laughs> Uh, the first one I would say, which is what we talked about, get domestic capital excited about this sector you know, and financing into this sector and do whatever it takes to, to make that happen. Second is develop uh, the International Financial Services Center as a hub for getting green financing into India. Uh, we didn't right. talk too much about that, but I think there's an opportunity there. And finally, I would say, and this is a very technical uh, you know, point, but for uh, the for, for the kind of the transmission of energy, reduce the wheeling charges, all the intermediation charges that are you know that are making energy. Uh, I would say it, it, you know you're forced to kind of sell energy only through a PPA to a discom, etc. Reduce that, and that will actually create more uh, freedom and I would say uh, competition in the in the entire grid and actually make generation much more cost effective. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sujay. I wish we had more time to ask many questions that we had. Thank you so much for such an engaging and enriching discussion, much like pandemic has taught us. There is reason to celebrate the power of uh, human spirit. I would like to conclude with this quote from uh, Martin Luther King Jr. We must accept finite disappointment, but never lose infinite hope. With that, thanks again to the panelists and audience. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pankaj. Thank thanks you. To the thanks. 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 Great job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you Mr. Pankaj. Thank you. Thank, thank everybody. Over to you, Vatsala. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that was a very insightful and holistic discussion. It is a delight to know that the private sector stands at the same uh, uh, visionary plane as the government to transition to a green carbon neutral economy. Dialogue and public-private uh, cooperation is the key. Indeed, carbon neutrality is an all-encompassing phenomena which requires a paradigm change in the way all the branches, leaves, twigs of the economy work. I would like to extend a warm gratitude from the Terry fraternity to all the panelists who have put their valuable time from their schedule and have joined us from different parts of India and the world in order to make this panel discussion a success. Further, I'd like to thank our partner, Terry Clean Tech Capital, for making the discussion possible. Have a great WSDS. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Vatsala. Thank Thanks, Vatsala. Thanks, Terry. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone.